morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. It's good to see you today. You glad to be here today? Amen. Amen. All right. So turn to your neighbor, say hi. What's your name? Hi. Hi. What's your name? Hi. <laughs> you don't know? I bet he does. I bet he does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> What's up, bro? Hey, my name is Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Good. All right. Now that you know the name of your neighbor, the one here. All right. All right. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. So a few announcements here. Um, Connection card in your bulletin, everybody find that, fill that out, you can put it on the table uh, where you picked up your communion in the back. If you haven't picked up your communion yet, please feel free to get up and go back and get the communion. Uh, I saw a communion tray heading out the door, it was empty and says, we got to go get more communion. I like Thank that. <laughs> All right, so um, the red cross blood drive uh, no I, I picked up the wrong I picked up the wrong sheet <laughs> that was a couple weeks ago there we go all right so the annual food holiday distribution we collected one thousand four hundred and forty eight dollars <laughs> Saturday, December 2nd. You know what happens? Thank you. Live Nativity set up. This will be our 35th year, I guess, uh, 36th year we've been doing this. And it's going to be new because now we have our whole scene on the hill that we're going to be lighting up. And uh, uh, so it's, it's going to be good and different this year. So our, our setup is 9 a.m. Saturday morning, December 2nd. And then the live nativity itself will be the next Friday and Saturday uh, from 5.45 to 8 o'clock. Now, that means what? It's time for you all to sign up. Thank you. So when you go out the doors today, you see the uh, uh, bulletin board is all I'm thinking of back there. And you find the... Uh, where you want to serve, and you can put your name on there. Now, is there a insert in the bulletin today with front of the live nativity? Okay, well, there we go. So this is the easier way to do it. So you can put what time you're willing to serve, a Friday or a Saturday, and what, uh, there's three segments there, and then what scene you want to do. And then you just check, this is the scene I want to do, this is the time I want to do it in, and then you don't take this home. <laughs> you leave it on the table so that we know what to do with it, right? Everybody say right. 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 Okay, you are listening. <laughs> Thank you. <Lee>. All <laughs> right, good deal. Um, elders and deacons meeting and ladies uh, Christmas and secret sister reveal party uh, this coming, no, was that? Oh, December 12th. December 12th. And then our candlelight communion service. Now, Christmas Eve is on Sunday this year. So that means we're going to have a, uh, of course, our special Christmas service Sunday morning. And then that night we're going to have our special Christmas Eve service. Does that sound backwards? Yeah. That that's the way we're doing it. Okay. <laughs> and uh, this group that you see behind me today that uh, has led us this morning is, going, is also preparing some really special stuff. Uh, for uh, the services as well. So you want to make sure you do not come by yourself. You want to bring somebody with you. It's a great time to invite somebody to come. All right. The uh, winter standard devotion booklets are in. They're on the table in the hallway. And uh, if you pick those up, or even if you haven't picked one up before, it's a great devotional, you can pick that up. So I'd like to ask Tom and Marilyn Chamberlain to come up front here. Now most of you do not know this couple. 
that they are our uh, guest of honor today, and I truly, truly mean that. Uh, Tom and Marilyn have served as missionaries for the kingdom of the Lord for 44 years. And, uh, and we have been supporting them, uh, I don't know, approximately 25, 20, it was before I came, which was 22 years ago. So um, they, uh, we have been long-term supporters of them. And uh, at the end of the year, uh, they are going to be retiring from Team Expansion, uh, whom they have been with, and uh, moving to Florida for the winter months anyway. And for the winter months, yes. for the winter months. okay. <laughs> and uh, so I wondered, uh, Tom's going to be our speaker today, and he uh, uh, shared some things in, this, in Sunday school today that just phenomenal. And uh, so we're looking forward to, to uh, hearing what the Lord has to, to say through you today. But we wanted to honor you two uh, today and to give you a gift from our congregation. Uh, this is called the Thumbprint of God. Have you seen it before? I've seen it once. Okay. But you don't have one. No. Well, now no. you do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank you. Just one more thing and then we'll get on with it. I have a card here from the congregation and uh, we're going to open it up and put it out there. If anybody wants to sign this, you'll be able to sign it after the service and then we'll give you the card later. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's all stand this morning as we read God's word from the book of Psalms this morning, from chapter 73. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak. But God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. To those who desert him will perish. For when you destroy those who obey you. But as for me, how good is it to be near God? I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter. And I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do.
that your prayers are answered by God. Thank you, everyone, for your prayers, thoughts, the soup, the cards. I appreciate it. Here we are, communion time. Well, what is so special about communion, and why does everyone hear me okay? Good. What? No, you can't. How about now? Oh, I gotta put it right on my lips. Okay. <laughs> why does Paul, to the letter to the Corinthians, make such a big deal out of discerning the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that's because God is righteous. And he's not going to let a bunch of sinners into his kingdom unjustified. God is righteous. And Jesus is that righteousness for us. I'd like to read from Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. For by works of the law, no human, that's zero, zada, none of us on planet earth, will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law although the law and the prophets bear witness to the law the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace is a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a participation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be the just and also the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ and that's each and every one of us. To petitiate means to satisfy the wrath of God against sin, to turn away God's wrath, to offer a sacrifice that appeases God's just judgment and righteous anger against us in our sins. And we might note that Jesus is both the juster and the justifier. Without Jesus, there is no justification. Without Jesus, there is no sacrifice for sin. Without Jesus, there is no redemption. Without Jesus, the wrath of God, righteous anger against us and our sins would still remain. Without Jesus, we would be hopelessly lost. And you could go on and on with without Jesus and fill in the blank. But thank God, Jesus did come and die for us. Amen? Amen. And we have fellowship with him, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and with one another in communion is we remember what Jesus done, and he has done it all. We're saved by grace. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and partake. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the body of Jesus, for his perfect life, for dying on the cross, and more than that, raising from the dead, victorious over sin. We thank you for his blood, of the new covenant that cleanses us from our sins. And we ask a blessings upon these emblems as we partake this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Take it at your free time.
Do you remember your neighbor's name? Because we don't want anyone to leave today without having been prayed for by name. So uh, we're going to bow our heads, pray for your neighbors, pray for their healing spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, relationships. The Lord knows what's going on in our lives. He does. So let's pray for one another. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you and we praise you this morning for your presence, for the promises of your word, that you would be in our midst when we gathered together. Lord, all of us have needs here this morning. You know each one. And I pray, Lord, that in a mighty way that you would minister to each person today, touch their hearts, touch their minds. And as we look to you, Lord, for the answers to the things that we face, that you will provide those answers, whatever aspect of life that it is. We pray for your healing for sicknesses. We pray for your presence and healing for those who are grieving. We pray, Lord, that in the circumstances that we will face this week, that you will uh, help us, give us wisdom, provide for us opportunities to uh, give a good word uh, about you, to give you glory, to lift you up, Jesus Christ, because you are the answer to all our needs, and we need to let other folks know that. And, and so help us, Lord, in that. We pray, Lord, for our co-workers around the world who have already uh, had their corporate worships today or will be having but we're all joined together, Lord, lifting up a praise to you, thanking you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Provide for them uh, financially, the materials they need, the, the, all the, Lord, you are our provider. And so we pray, Lord, that you would provide in every way. Just as we have prayed for one another, we pray for our co-workers in Christ. And we thank you, Lord, for Tom and Marilyn Chamberlain for the service that they have offered to you and will continue to offer to you, even though it's a new chapter that's coming up. We pray for your mighty blessing upon uh, them. And uh, Tom, as he speaks and brings your word today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Tom? It's a joy to be with you here at Northview again, and uh, I want to say a thank you to each and every one of you for the church here, for the years of uh, praying for us, supporting us in mission work, and uh, the Lord has been good, and he always is good, and we are so happy to uh, have been able to serve the Lord these many years. And we're looking forward to what the Lord brings next for us. But it, as I said to a, another friend, it will just not be a full-time paid ministry <laughs> like it's been in the past. Now we'll be uh, volunteering our time and our efforts to serve the Lord. I hope uh, none of you will be offended that I, I brought my cell phone with my sermon notes and, uh, and the scripture in it. I have found it's very difficult for me to see text very well on a printed page any longer. And uh, cell phone is um, amazing where you can zoom, <laughs> make it bigger, <laughs> uh, change the background to, you know, white or black, and, you know, just make it what you need it to be. <clears throat> but first and foremost, we want to share with you this morning that the Lord has been good. He has been good both to Marilyn and to me, to our family, in all our years of service, and we want to thank you for that and for your prayers and your support. 
I want to share with you a message that I've entitled, A Great Door for Effective Work. Uh, that phrase may even sound familiar to some of you. If you want to turn, you could look in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9. And really, I'm just going to be taking kind of that one verse as the principal phrase that we're going to be using this morning to focus on. <clears throat> And we'll read it, and we'll read verses 5 through 9 in just a, a few moments. The Apostle Paul was an itinerant preacher, a missionary, and he was revisiting a group of disciples, that is, churches gathered together in Macedonia and down into Greece. And from there, he was headed over into Ephesus in what we know as modern-day Turkey, on the western edge of Turkey. He wants to revisit them in Corinth after Pentecost in the springtime, and he stayed on then in Ephesus for an additional three years. Let's read uh, these verses together here from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But if I stay on it at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who are who oppose me would you pray with me please father in heaven we approach your word this morning we approach you this morning in reading your word and we want to be sensitive to your voice your holy spirit who indwells us as disciples of Jesus, and we want to hear you speak to us. Father, we worship you. We serve you. Help us, Father, prepare us for this week, and help us to serve you as you see fit. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> You'll hear my voice crack. You'll hear <clears throat> things happening in there. Uh, it's a part of age, I think. <laughs> I deal with it all the time, so I make sure I always have my cough drop with me. And if I get too dry, I'll start to cough, and then it's done. It's done. So you'll have to bear with me. <clears throat> it's also a timer, by the way. <laughs> Missionaries go from place to place, don't they? And they find all kinds of ways in which to share the gospel. And they pray for fruit to bring glory to our Heavenly Father and to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I just want to use this opportunity to share a little bit about what God has been doing <clears throat> through ministry at Team Expansion. And some of it has been through Marilyn and I, but uh, there are over 350 missionaries serving through Team Expansion. So we're just one small part of this, okay? There are missionaries serving in some 60 to 70 countries around the world. And uh, on every continent except Antarctica. We haven't needed to send anybody there. <clears throat> we have teams that are using things like Facebook groups and Google ads, and they are ads pointed to target certain people, a people group. It might be a people group hidden within another group of people. It's difficult in some parts of the world now to go as a missionary. You can't just automatically go. You have to have another platform or a way to be there legally in that country. 
but God is using things like the Facebook ads and Google ads to a particular target people in a particular place. And we're seeing some of them come to Christ in these last couple of years. In the, in the country of Spain, uh, Marilyn and I have been responsible for teams there that serve in Spain. And that's been my role. I've been a field coordinator for team expansion all 26 years that I've served with them. Started out in South America, some in Central America, Mexico, and now into Spain. And I didn't even mention uh, in Sunday school class, I also was responsible for uh, a couple in England and another uh, couple that was serving in Ireland and a couple serving in Israel. So there are lots of places. But what I wanted to share with you is that in Granada, Spain, one of our teams there, they do disciple-making movement trainings where they're training people how to start small Bible study groups. And then they, in turn, will start other Bible study groups. And they, in turn, will start others. And we've got to get past the idea that the missionary or the preacher that they're going to win all the loss, because it's never going to happen that way. All of us have to be a part of it. And we have to do our part in sharing the good news of Jesus with our relatives, you know, our own family, our own children, our parents, uncles, aunts, whomever it may be, with the people where we work, at school, where we, where we have kids going, whatever it may be. We have to be that voice for Jesus as well. But our team in Spain, in Granada, saw 34 new Discovery Bible Study groups started in one year. And of those that got started, 19 started a second Bible study group. And of those 19, they saw 125 people trained in discipleship ministry and seeing an entire movement begin to happen just from their activity in Granada, Spain. Even among non-literate people, groups, individuals learned to tell God's story and share their testimony in how they came to Christ. It didn't matter whether they could read or not. They remember well, and this is one of the things that I've always been amazed about, People who don't read well remember much times much better than most of us who read because they have to depend upon the memory and what they've heard in order to repeat it to others. We have teams that are doing medical clinics and hospitals and they minister to people as they have physical needs. It's amazing to me to see some of those things that happen we have, a, we have a hospital group working in Cambodia, as an example. They are seeing great things happen there. And everybody who comes there as a patient, first of all, hears the gospel as they're being attended to in their physical needs. So God is being preached. Jesus is being proclaimed. And people are hearing it, no matter what their background may be or if they've come from some distant village because of a physical ailment and they need treatment, they're getting to hear the gospel message. We have a, a thing happening in Israel. We have a couple there that are working among a people group called the Druze. Now, many people think I, I'm saying Druid, but it's not Druid. Druze, D-R-U-E-Z-E, D-R-U-Z-E, -E, D -R -U -Z -E, Druze. They come from a Persian background. They split off from Muslims a couple of centuries ago, and they remain very closed to the gospel. But our missionary there has designed three- to four-minute video segments, and they produce these, and they put one out every week. And even among Muslims, because they are so concerned about somebody knowing if they're listening to anything other than the Koran, that they, <clears throat> they have an opportunity on their phones to go to a website and to watch a video, and they can watch the entire thing. And our missionary actually is able to track and see how many people not only went to that site, how many people watched the entire video. 
And of, of the, the amazing thing is, among the Druze people, we're seeing 25% of the Druze people are watching the entire videos. Now, they're not all coming to Christ yet. Why? Because they're fearful of the controls that are happening within their own people group. So individually, we find people coming to faith in Jesus. But they're, they are locked in a system to where they can't get out and publicly say, I'm a believer in Jesus, because if they do, they're either kicked out of their home, they're divorced, they're thrown in jail, or they could be killed. Those kinds of things are still happening in the world today. One of the uh, people that was working in these videos, her name was Lena. She was, a, she was the voice for the Druze in these videos. You use an, a native speaker, you know, rather than a foreigner. Lena was reading all these scripts and doing all these videos, and she came to faith in Jesus because of it. And we just praise God for the way that his word is having an impact in the lives of these people. We also see that many times God uses even our mistakes. Uh, the missionary there in, in Israel one time got another video ready, and uh, he thought, okay, it's all ready to go, and he sent it out. And then he started checking to see how many people were looking at it and watching the video. And before long, he saw 3,000 complete views, 5,000 complete views, 20,000 complete views, 40,000 complete views of this video. And wouldn't you know, this particular vi video was the one that was called the real Jesus of the Bible. And he didn't realize what he had done was he forgot to mark one little thing on the getting it sent out. Because he would have only sent it to the Druze in that particular locale. No, it went out to all the people of Israel and Lebanon and Syria. And he was getting response from people all over that part of the Islamic world and the Druze that lived there. So God uses even our mistakes to turn around and proclaim his word and to see great things happen. We have sending bases in, in some, some places around the world. We have, uh, we have a thing happening in the country of Laos. I don't know if you know, but in Laos, you are not allowed to convert another person to, in their religion. If you do you are arrested and taken to jail. So what we're doing is we have a sending base there of Laotians ha that have become Christians, and they've been trained in making disciples. And now they're going out by twos, just like Jesus sent them out in the New Testament. They're going out by twos. They're crossing rivers. They're climbing mountains. They're going into remote areas where the gospel has never been preached and they're sharing the gospel and this simple method of starting these little Bible studies. Two young women were doing this in, <clears throat> in Laos. And in one village, many people liked what they were hearing, but then others came that were in opposition. And they threatened these young women that they were going to physically harm them, that they were going to sexually assault them, and that they were going to kill them. And these two young women ran off into the jungle and stayed in the jungle overnight just for their own safety. Went back into that same village in the morning to confirm the faith of several who put faith in Jesus and then traveled on. Just like the old missionary efforts that were done in the New Testament, we've got that same kind of thing still happening today. And I praise God for it. People who are willing to put their lives on the line and to say, I'm here for Jesus and I will proclaim his name and will let the chips fall where they may. We have teams that are working in places like Brazil. I oversee the man that's in charge of a project in Brazil. He is Brazilian. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his family, but he oversees an outreach to five unreached tribes, never been reached before with the gospel, and he has found and employed five indigenous, meaning Indian background, uh, evangelists to go to each of these five groups. 
He just made a trip back down there in September, and my supervisor, Eric Derry from Team Expansion, went with him, and they learned all kinds of great things, and we're seeing some of the first baptisms of these tribal groups that even the government tries to keep you out of it. They don't let you. You can't even go to their village. You get to a certain checkpoint, and the government stops you there. Only the indigenous people can go in there. So what happens? Sometimes there's a physical need in one of those villages. That person that is sick comes out of the village and comes to the nearest city for medical treatment. Our evangelist is there, makes contact with them, shares the gospel with them, and they in turn then get invited back into their village. And so we're seeing some of the first baptisms of people in places like Brazil, in the upper reaches of the headwaters of the Amazon, or out into the northeastern area of Brazil where there are still many unreached tribes. <clears throat> we have a team that's been working in Ghana, Ghana, Africa. This team has grown so dramatically, not with missionaries, not with North American missionaries, but with the nationals that have come to Christ that they have turned around and trained and sent them out. And we've seen it grow from a few hundred to thousands and then they're crossing the border of Ghana into neighboring countries and carrying the gospel into these other countries as well. And we, we saw in one year over 3,600 baptisms just in that one field alone. God is blessing, and God is moving with the power of his Holy Spirit among those who are receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Venezuela it's another example of a sending base. And that's one that I've worked with for quite a while. Because I would visit Venezuela every year from 1998 until the present, except for the two years of COVID when nobody could go anywhere. And you folks remember that, don't you? <laughs> I, I will say this. I almost lost my wife, Marilyn, to COVID during that time. Uh, we, had, we had gone to Louisville. This is not a part of my sermon. We had gone to Louisville for the funeral of the missionary who was serving in Ireland. He and his family had returned from Ireland. He got sick with COVID here in the United States and never recovered, and he passed away. And that's been three years ago now. We went to his funeral and memorial service. We came back up to Michigan. Marilyn got sick. I got sick. Her case was much worse than mine, and she ended up in the hospital for 11 days and the emergency room doctor told her, you'll never leave this hospital. He was wrong because the power of God was at work by God's people who were praying for Maryland. <clears throat> and I have a good friend that was a preacher uh, down near Archibald, Ohio. Uh, his name is Larry Snow. And COVID took him. And... Uh, it's not to say that God couldn't have saved him, but we never know where God's going to work and when he's going to work, and we just have to trust, have to trust in him, and that's what we'll continue to do. I wanted to tell you briefly, though, about Venezuela. It's ending base in Venezuela, and uh, we have four locations in Spain. Would you believe we have Venezuelans as missionaries on, in all four of those locations in Spain? The Venezuelans have come up th to come to Christ and come up through our training, been trained as missionaries and evangelists, and put it into practice in Venezuela first. And then we've taken them into other countries, into North Africa, for instance. And they're doing great work in a country in North Africa that we call Epiphany. And because this may be recorded, I'm not going to say the real name of that country. For security reasons, we have people there working among Muslim people, and they are in danger for their lives if, if, uh, if the word gets out. In fact, we had a team working, I can say this because we no longer have them there, we had a team working in Afghanistan several years ago. And that team that was working in Afghanistan, some extremists got a hold of their pictures and posted them in the public square. And within a day's time, a grenade was tossed across the wall into their yard and blew up so no one was injured praise god for that but i'm just saying there are dangers out there folks that most of us never have to experience because of us sharing the gospel but it's happening in places around the world 
Venezuela is, is a great uh, team, great sending base. They've sent people into, into Spain, into Colombia. Uh, they're doing work among tribal groups and unreached uh, people groups in Colombia as well as in Venezuela. One of their own Venezuelan gals became an expert in Bible translation work, and she goes upriver to work among a group called the Warao, W-A-R-A-O, Warao Indians. And she goes up the river by canoe for about 16 to 18 hours in a motorized canoe to get far enough up the river to reach this Indian tribe. And there she's been serving the Lord. God has been blessing tremendously in outreaches, and God is seeing many, many wonderful things happen. I believe that there are lots of great doors for effective work today in the world, and we need to continue to pray that God will help us all to step through those doors and be used of him. That scripture that I read this morning in verse 9 Paul talked about an effective door, a, a great door for effective work, but then he added one more phrase. Did you catch that in verse 9? There are many who oppose. There's much opposition to the work of God in the world today. I want to tell you about a situation that happened with a friend of mine in Tanzania. Um, I made a trip, I told the Sunday school class, I made a trip in early October to Spain and Jason Garo, who's been serving 11 years in, in Tanzania with his wife and children, he met me there because he's, over, he's taking over my role as field coordinator. So I was introducing him to each team and, and making sure we made a good connection there, and that was the official handoff in October for those teams. But Jason <clears throat> told us all about a situation in, in Tanzania. Many Muslims are coming to Christ. One of the things that Jason and the team do there, they buy these little SIM card chips and then they put the Arabic Bible on them because most of all of Muslims read the, the, read the Quran in Arabic. So they put that on the SIM chips and they give these chips away to anybody who wants one. They put it in their phone and it's, it's secretive this way. Nobody knows that you have an Arabic Bible because it's in your phone. And it's on a chip in your phone. It doesn't even show up unless you open an app to get into it. But anyhow, uh, they hand out these chips, and they're having great success with many, many people coming to profess faith in Jesus. Well, what happened was one of the villages, the Islamic cleric, who's called an imam, his daughter had come to faith in Christ. When he found out that she was believing in Jesus and wanted to be a Christian and follow Jesus, he said, no, no, this isn't going to happen. You're going to marry a Muslim man, and you're going to be a Muslim. You're no longer going to be a follower of Jesus. She was so distraught over what he was going to do, and he had a man picked out. She ran away from home and ran into the jungle in Tanzania and disappeared for three days. <clears throat> the Islamic cleric got very nervous because there is a law in Tanzania. She had left a letter that she was running away because her father was going to make her marry a Muslim and all of these things, and it could be seen as a suicide note. And in Tanzania, if you are the person who's responsible for someone else taking their own life, you are the one that will be hauled into prison. So the Islamic cleric got very nervous about all of that. And when she came back three days later, he had changed his entire mind about it. And he said, you can be a Christian. I will not force you to marry a Muslim. You can be a Christian. And anyone else in this village who wants to follow Jesus can do so. And there will be no retribution against them. That's how God can work. That's how God can work in an impossible situation where we see no way out. But God has a way of working things out for his honor and for his glory. Many have been kicked out of their towns once they became Christians. 
Some have lost property. I know of others, I've read incidents of those who have been beaten to within an inch of their life, of a young man who was wrapped in barbed wire and drugged behind a vehicle until he died because of his faith in Jesus. These kinds of things are still happening today. Many times people are not allowed any job. If you become a Christian, you're locked out of any kind of a job opportunity. They suffer imprisonment. We had a couple that were working in northern and eastern Africa that because they were sharing their faith in Jesus with others and people had converted to Christ, this African couple were arrested and put into prison. And they were threatened with death penalty for what they had done. They were held for over a year in prison, even with their two-month-old baby in prison for preaching Jesus. But what did they do? Instead of cowering and giving up, they began to share their faith in Jesus with the guards who would listen, with those who brought them food or water. They shared the gospel with everyone that they could. And God's people were praying around the world for this couple. And when it came to a court decision, they were released and not imprisoned. They did have to leave the country because they were not native to that country. But they did not lose their lives. They were able to remain faithful and true to Jesus and to go back to their own country. And I'm sure that that witness is true and having its effect in that place even now. I think of all of these who have suffered such things as beatings and sexual assaults and imprisonment. The two gals in, in Laos as they had to go hide in the jungle. And I am reminded of the passage from Hebrews chapter 11 verses 36 through 38. And it says there, some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Folks, let me tell you that it is still happening today. There are more people being martyred for Christ today than ever before. Even in the time of Jesus, there are more people being martyred every year for their faith in Jesus today. I want to mention one other. This is the Druze believer that has worked with our missionary in Israel. He checks with the with the missionary, they work on a video together, and he will, as a Druze, will say, my people wouldn't say it this way, or they wouldn't tell the story this way. So they make changes to it to make it appropriate for the Druze people. This man's name is Hale. Believe it or not, he's here in the United States right now. But Hale, because of his, because of his faith in Christ, the Druze came to him, the Druze leaders, and said, you will recant you will be, come back to being a Druze or we will hurt you badly. He continued to have his faith in Jesus, continued to live for Jesus. They started doing things to his vehicle, cutting spark plug wires and pouring stuff in the gas tank. And eventually they kicked him out of the town where he was living. And he moved to another town. But because of his faithful following of Jesus and these videos that they were producing, guess what? Hale's daughter, who lives in South Africa, just a year ago, got in touch with her father and said, you know, I believe all of this that you're teaching. And she actually went to Israel and she was baptized into Christ. Now Armel, the daughter has been taking these same videos and with permission of the missionaries and her dad, Hale, has been taking them into South Africa, has put up her own website down there, is getting them put into Afrikaans, 
and they're public they're publishing them down there to help people come to Christ in in South Africa where she's living. And Armel was living with with her mom. Her mom is the ex-wife of Hale. And guess what happened just this last summer? Armel's mom says, I've seen such a change in Armel. This has to be true. I want to be baptized into Christ too. So God is at work, folks. He can do immeasurably more than we ever imagine or think. And most of the time, we're the ones who put the limits on God. Not that he has any limits that he can't overcome. So brethren, let me, let me just say, there are many who oppose, both here and abroad, but God is all-powerful. Jesus still saves. And he changes lives, and it is notable. Armel's mom saw the difference in her at home, and she wanted to follow Jesus too. There are many who oppose, but God is powerful. I want to tell you, among the Muslim people, the missionaries keep asking people here in the United States, would you pray that the people here see more visions and have more dreams of Jesus? And it is happening all the time in the Muslim lands. And they will, uh, this happened not in Muslim, Muslim situation, this happened in Brazil. Our missionary went down there in September, and a woman came to him and said, you know, I've been having this dream about a man in white. And our missionary started talking to her about that, and then she had it again and had it again. He talked to her another time, and he said, I am certain now that you've had this three or four times. This is a message from God, the God of the Bible, and it's about Jesus wanting to save you from your sins. And she who is the assistant, you might say, or sub-tribal tribal leader in that indigenous group, has become a, a Christian, a follower of Jesus, and it's opening the door to her entire tribe. Even though there's opposition, God is powerful, and he can do anything. Anything. So keep praying for our people around the world who are sharing the gospel of Jesus. I wanted to close with one simple little thing. It's, it's down in verses that we didn't read. But if that same chapter, if you had it open, look at verse 13. We need to stand firm in our faith and be courageous. Paul, in writing this to the Corinthians at the end of the letter, says, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men, can I say, people of courage. And be strong. Brethren, I'm asking you to be that way too. Be strong in the Lord. Be people of faith. Be people of courage. And stand firm in Jesus. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you rest. Thank you for allowing me to share with you this morning. God came to earth, and we know him as Jesus, and he lived the life to show us how we can live for God, and he was killed, he was crucified on that cross, there was a purpose for it, it was for each one of us and for our sins, Jesus paid that price, and he died, and he was placed in the grave. He was in that grave for three days and three nights. But by the hand of God, by the mighty hand of God, Jesus was raised from the dead, conquering death. That's good news, folks, because now all those who believe in him be forgiven of their sin because they know he paid for their sin. And now they will have the power because his spirit lives in us. We have the power to walk, to live this Christian life. 
that uh, we can live in uh, Jesus. And uh, that's why we baptize folks who believe in Jesus, that they may be united in his death and in his resurrection, giving us the power to walk in this Christian life, forgiven of all of our sins. That's good news, right? Amen. So let's stand and let's sing, Jesus, draw me close, closer, Lord, to you. If there's anybody who wants to respond to that gospel, come on up front. Reading from Romans 6, beginning with the third verse. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too will walk in the newness of life. 
For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Sometimes we see the stage and everything, we think it's all formal, but try to be as informal as we can, be real life. So let's just get on up close here and we'll have this in just a moment. As soon as uh, Blaine is baptized, we're going to sing, Now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for how long? Eternity. For eternity, that's right. We have been praying for this fella for the last 22 years since our daughter's been born. And uh, I am so honored to baptize him today. Blaine, Ryan, Wayne, Bussell, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mary with Christ, praise the newness of life.
accept this day as a game.